Okay. I got a specific, hey, Joel, so thank you for that. Um, so before we jump into Matthew, I want to talk about a couple things. So obviously, if you've been here for any amount of time, you know that we're kind of in the middle of a transitional period. We, we our, our founding pastor just resigned, and in that, that can foster a lot of confusion and concerns, a lot of questions. And what, what happens is you, you, you may come up, come up to a, a leader, and you may say, X, Y, Z question, X, Y, Z concern. And we may say, I, I don't know, but we will figure that out. We'll work on it. So the danger of that is when there's not clear questions, when there's not clear resolutions, clear, and there's, there's not clarity, really, and we're living it out together, sometimes it leaves room for us to talk amongst ourselves. And when we talk amongst ourselves, sometimes stories get crossed, and our theories and our concerns may get convoluted, and we may think, well, maybe this is true. And it, it could create a narrative, and that narrative could turn into a rumor. So the danger of this right now, church, is we need to be unified. We need to come together as a family and support each other and pray for each other. So if you at any point in time hear a rumor, hear something about someone that you feel just doesn't sound right, go to that person directly. Ask them about it. Get the truth. Figure out what's going on. Because we have no room for, for division and drama in this church. Amen? Yes. Okay. So, if you've been with us for the past couple weeks, several weeks actually, you will know that we're in the middle of a parable series. And Pastor Mark, Pastor Dalton, Pastor Doug have all done an amazing job. I've loved it. I've gotten a lot out of it. I've grown. So I hope you have as well. But like Pastor Dalton said last week, and actually this, this morning, I'm, I'm working through Matthew 25, 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. And I'm going to give you the punchline of the sermon right now before we start, so you have some time to think on it and sit in it. So it is how you invest your life today will matter for eternity. How you invest your life today will matter for eternity. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for being an amazing God. We sing the song, All Hail King Jesus, the Savior of the world. And Lord, as we talk about these gifts that you've given us and how you've called us to give them back to you, Lord, I ask that you just open our hearts, open our minds to something that we may be holding on to and not letting go of. Lord, thank you for this time, every person in these seats, Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and your grace. Be with us this morning. It's in your name. Amen. So how you invest your life today will matter for eternity. So the parable of the talents is a story that Jesus told about financial investment. And to be honest, I'm not the most savvy financial investor. Like, to t tell myself a little bit, 2010... I had done some research and I looked, looked into this thing called Bitcoin. And I, I was like, yeah, like, that seems like a cool concept. Like I can put like a hundred bucks towards it, no big deal. So I, I kind of put off, put off, put it off. And at near the end of the year, I got a fairly large commission check from, from, my, my, from my work. And I was like, you know what, now's the time. I'm gonna put a hundred dollars towards Bitcoin. Well, at this point in time, a Bitcoin was worth about $10. So I started the process, and it's a little, it was a little complicated. It wasn't super user-friendly back in the day. You had to like buy money orders and mail them off and correspond with people, and I just shrugged it off and decided not, not to do it. Well, if anyone knows about Bitcoin, Bitcoin's currently $27,000 per coin, and I could have bought 10 of them for $100 and I didn't because it was complicated. <laughs> so I'd be lying if I said I didn't wince every time I think about that $100 that I probably spent on, on a pizza or something. But that happens, it is what it is. <laughs> so Jesus tells us this story about financial investment. But as we work through it, I think you will see that he is talking a lot, he's talking about a lot more than just being wise with your money. 
So let's jump in, in, in the passage. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. So in this part of the passage, we get to know the four characters in the story. And it's important to identify what the context of the parable is, and then also who the people, who the characters are in relationship to us and Christ and others and so on and so forth. So the context that we're looking at right now is this is the last week of Jesus' life. So he is swinging for the fences. He is not like, he's, he is not sugarcoating anything. He's being direct. But he's also preparing us. He's preparing his disciples for his leaving, but then also for his returning. And in the story, Christ is the man, the man who leaves on a journey. And the three servants, that's us. And we have to, as we work through the passage, figure out which of the three servants we are. So another thing to keep in mind is the word talent. You may hear talent and think of this innate skill you have, this ability that you have. And you may have heard it in church even, preached that you need to use your talents for the Lord. If you can sing, you better glorify the Lord. If you're personable, you better use that personality trait to further the gospel. And that, those two things may not be wrong, but they don't really envelop the full scope of what this passage is trying to say. Walk away with from this, this parable. The first one is, all that we have is a gift from God. All that we have is a gift from God. So if you believe that, I want you to think about all the unique opportunities that God has given you. All the unique things, all the unique interactions, all the unique opportunities that you have that no one else does. Christ has given us our money, our time, our homes, our children, our family, our social media influence, our jobs, our cars, and through salvation, our ability to connect to him through prayer, our ability to connect with him through worship. All those things are your talent. They're the gift that God gave you. So, there are two things, there are two ways that you can handle this talent, this gift. And you could either be a steward or an owner. A steward or an owner. So these are two very, very different things. An owner is, this mentality is, it's mine, I can do with it what I want. Like, if, 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 if I want to go blow this money on this, or if I want to spend my time doing this, it doesn't matter. It's mine. I can do what I want. That's the that's mentality of an owner. The perspective of a steward is very different because you, you, you say, okay, this is God's. He has entrusted this to me so that I could use it for his purposes, for his glory, for his kingdom. I would have nothing without him, so I will give it back to him. So I want you to think about a scenario. So service ends, we have hot dogs and we hang out. And then you're like, you know what? I wanna go to, on a Walmart, Best Buy, Target, and I wanna get my kids a new cell phone. And you're like, well, Joel, why would I do that? Just play along with me, okay? So. You get them a new cell, you take them, to, take them to the store, you're like, okay, fill in the blank kid name, go pick out a phone. So the key, I want you, I want you to let them do all the talking. I want, I want you to let them handle it, grab it, carry it to the register. Really, like, like it's theirs. So I... So when you're ready, they've done all the talking, they've handled it, they've turned it on, they've messed with it. I want you, the key to this is you pay for it. 
with your money. Okay, and then you get in the car that you pay for, and you head to a restaurant where you're going to pay for the food, but you, you, you're not really sure where the restaurant is, so you have to use GPS. So you get in the car, and your kid's in the back seat, and they're just loving life because they have snacks that you bought. They're texting, they're downloading apps, they're taking selfies. Life is grand, everything's perfect in their small little world. Until your phone dies. And you're like, oh, I don't know how to get that restaurant. Hey, can I see your phone? What are they gonna do? Oh yeah, sure mom, sure dad, absolutely. There, there, there wouldn't be a single, Ugh! Or a single, uh, like, no, there may be none of that. No rolled eyes. <laughs> of course there would be. What would they say? But it's mine. You just got this for me. I'm messing with it. It's mine. Let me play with it. Well, no, fill in the blank name. We have to get to the restaurant where I'm going to buy you food. And so... I, I don't know if you're like me, and if you are, like, I'm sorry, but if, <laughs> with, if, if, if I ever hear that, which I hear that sometimes, I'm always like, huh, see those clothes that you're wearing that I worked for and I earned money and I bought, take those off. You want dinner? Get a job. <laughs> no, I never say that. In my mind, I think it. Don't judge, don't judge me, but it's true. If you have kids, you know. So anyway, we get upset with our kids for reacting that way, but we do the exact same thing to Christ. It's mine. This house is mine. This money is mine. This time is mine. This life is mine. This health is mine. My job is mine. My position as a pastor of Sea Life Church is not mine. I'm called to hold it up for Christ to do whatever he wants with it. If I ever close my hand and say, this is mine, fire me. Everything you have is a gift from God and it needs to be used for his purposes. So let's jump back in. Verse 16, it says, the one who had received five talents immediately went and did business with them and earned five more talents. In the same way, the one who had received two talents earned two more. But he who received the one talent went away and he dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. So there's two very different uses of the investment, isn't there? I really love the fact that in verse 16, it says the guy with the five talents immediately went and invested it. Because he had just realized his life had changed forever. He'd been given this gift that he didn't deserve, and he had to go use it. Sound familiar? And then there's the one with the two. And he went and he did the same thing. But what I really love about the one with two, I love that Jesus included the two talent servant in this parable. Because he did the exact same thing. He took his two and he doubled it. And I think it puts it in perspective. Because I think we, a lot of times, can compare ourselves to those ten talent people to those pastors, to the Billy Grahams, to the Tim Kellers, to the Phil Wickhams, all these Christians who just do great things. But the two talent servant gets the same reward that the five talent because he did the exact same thing. He just doubled the investment. So don't compare yourself. 
Now the third guy. Womp womp. He does the exact opposite of the first two. Instead of maximizing his investment that Christ gave him, instead of living his life to glorify Christ, he dug a hole and he buried it. And unfortunately, I believe a lot of American Christianity is that today. In this parable, or in the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son takes his birthright and he blows it on immoral living and alcohol and women and partying. And like we know from that parable, Christ receives him back. The father receives him back. But this guy didn't blow his money. He just didn't use it. He just buried it. He hid it. He never used it to further the kingdom. So it's a tragedy, but it's important for, in order for us to continue in, in the passage. In verse 19, it says, Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. When someone's gone, we tend to start to adapt to them being gone. And we, and we tend to forget that they're coming back, if they're coming back. And we, and we kind of, our life morphs in a way as if they're just not coming back. And the scary thing is if your servant number three is... Christ is coming back. This passage shows us the second truth that you need to walk away with. We will be held accountable for our lives. So what happens next is a master comes back and he gets the guys together. And he says, all right, show me what you've done. Show me how you've invested what I gave you. What did you produce what did you live your life for? Was it for me or was it for yourself? Church, something we, ha we have to recognize is that there's two moments of judgment that appear in the New Testament. The first one is, is reserved for those who reject Christ and they waste their talent. The terrifying, the potentially terrifying uh, truth that comes out of Revelation 20 it's called the great white throne judgment, where people who have refused to trust Christ, who have refused to use their talent, who have refused to believe in Christ's love and his sacrifice, they will be forever separated from the love and grace of God. But the beautiful thing is that everyone here or online who has received the gift of salvation, who has given their life over to the, to the master, will not have to face that judgment. If you have responded in faith, that judgment is not for us. Praise Jesus. The Bible says that there's no condemnation for followers of Christ. Jesus took your condemnation on the cross. He wiped it clean so that on that day at the great white throne judgment, Jesus, or Jesus wouldn't see your sin, but he would see the righteousness of Christ's blood. The second moment found is in 1 and 2 Corinthians. It's not a moment of judgment for the uh, people who have refused Christ, but it's a moment of accounting for your life if you are a follower of Christ. All of our lives, all of our choices, all of our actions, all of what we've built, do we build it for Jesus or do we build it for ourselves, our own motives? 1 Corinthians 3 describes that your works, if they're done true, for Christ, you'll be rewarded. But if your choices were done for yourself, if, if, we, if, our, our, if our good works are done for ourselves, our own ego, our own pride, then they'll be burned away with fire. So what are you doing today in your life? What will you, what are you doing with the talent that God gave you 
Will your works be left standing or will they burn away? Let's jump back into the passage. In verse 20, it says, the one who had received five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have earned five more talents. Can you hear that childlike joy? That excitement? Like, look, look, look what I did. Look what I did, God. Look, look what I did. I just, I, I think about Every time my sons come home off the bus, Stephen will show me whatever craft he made that day. And it looks exactly the same as the one he made the day before. But he's like, look, 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 is this awesome? I, just, I hear that same excitement out of, out of this tin talent servant. Just, God, look at what I've done for you. I'm so excited to show you what I've done. In 21, it says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have earned two more talents. The same excited, kid-like joy. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Can you imagine how it feels to hear those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. The third truth about investing your life for Jesus is there is a great reward in taking risks for Jesus. We see it in the life of these two. They spent their life working and fighting and taking risks for the master and they are rewarded. The Christian life is full of risks. We're we're called to lay down our life and trust God, obey, and even if it looks crazy to those around us. You see, throughout the Bible, so many of biblical heroes took risks. There's Noah. He built a giant boat in the middle of the desert where there was no water. But his, him and his family were rewarded when the rain came. David fought Goliath. Esther stood in front of the king. Paul laid down his life for the church over and over and over again. Church, is your life a life of risks? Are you willing to risk it all by living for Christ instead of yourself? I've heard it said, comfort zones don't make you safe, they make you small. Comfort zones don't make you safe, they make you small. Living where it's easy, listening to that voice, feeling and responding to that pull towards comfort in the Christian life does not not make you safe, it makes you small. John Piper said, the Christian life is a call to risk. You either live with risk or you waste your life. What risk is God calling you into today? Is God calling you into a career change? Into a career change that it's, it's away from what's comfortable. It's away from what is safe because you know it and you're good at it. But you know you could be doing more for the kingdom somewhere else. Is God calling you to go on the on on the the mission trip to the Dominican Republic in April? But you really want to go on this vacation. Is it something small? Is God asking you to forgive someone? Is God asking you to talk to your neighbors, your coworkers, about his love? He's placed them on your heart so many times before, but you've never shared the gospel with them. Is God calling you to start tithing? Have you been afraid holding on to your finances? Is God calling you to start volunteering and serving 
in the kids' ministry and on Wednesday night with, with the youth and student life, with the greet team, with the events team. I understand some of those things can be risky. It can make you uncomfortable. Because you're like, I could forgive them, but what if they do it again? Like, I could start tithing, but I'm already so strapped as it is. I could share the gospel, but what if they never talk to me again? What if there's an awkward roll up in my car and just walk inside? I don't, I don't have a neighbor to hang out with anymore. These are risky, I know. But risks taken for the kingdom of God will be worth it. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? Every risk taken in obedience of Christ is worth it. Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of the master. A faithful servant will be rewarded with greater responsibilities and greater joy. You see, you may work really hard to have cool cars or cool vacations or a cool house. You may work really hard to try to find joy in these things. But real joy is given by the master. When you take risks, he will give you joy. It doesn't matter how much you have, what you have. If, you have, if you're a one-talent servant, a two-talent servant, a five-talent servant, a 25-talent servant, you will be rewarded if you are faithful. What have you done with what God has given you? Do not compare yourselves to others online. Some of you in person or online, you may come, or you, you may be global, have global impact, major impact for, for, the, for the kingdom. Some of you may have local or professional influence. But some of you may only, your influence may only go as far as your living room, and your family, and your kids. And it, like I said, whether you're a one, a two, a five, a 25 talent servant, if you invest it, if you take risks and you give it to God, you'll be rewarded all the same. Well done, good and faithful servant. Unfortunately, this passage ends on a kind of tragic note. Now the one who had received the one talent also came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where he did not sow and gathering where he did not scatter seeds. And I was afraid. So I went away and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you still have what is yours. Do you hear that difference? That isn't the childlike excitement, that childlike joy. He assumes the worst. He accuses the master of a false claim. He doesn't know the master's character. He's afraid. In 26 it says, but his master answered and said to him, you worthless, lazy servant. Did you know, or did you know that I reap where I did not sow? and gather where I did not scatter seeds, then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take that talent away from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For everyone who has, more shall be given. And he who has abundance, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. And th throw the worthless servant into outer darkness in a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. To take us back to the beginning, the main point. 
how you invest your life today will matter for eternity. The servant with the one talent had the exact same opportunity that the servant with the two or the five. He had to serve. He had to know. He had to love the master. But he chose to fear the master. He chose to accuse the master, attack his character, and then bury his talent. When the master revealed to him that the, uh, the others, in the others, that he was never a servant to begin with. The master saw his lack of faith and said, you were never a servant to begin with. This is a clear warning, church. What we do with what God has given us, our talent, it matters, and it matters for all of eternity. You may say, Joel, I'm not, I'm not ready to take risks. I'm afraid I may fail. I'm afraid I may fall. And I totally understand that fear. But God has given you a gift. And if you compare the risk that you face to the risk that Jesus faced on the cross, I think it's pretty easy to relinquish control. As the band comes up, I want, I want to let you in to my heart a little bit. So being in this transitional time, I've had a lot of anxiety and this feeling of inadequacy, of can I lead this church? Can I be who this church needs me to be? Am I capable? to take this church into the future. And I've prayed and prayed, I've fasted, and I've looked for clarity, I've looked for answers. And as I was preparing for, for, for this message, I was pondering over the difference of steward and owner. And God slapped me in the face. Because a few years ago, a mentor that I used to have said, Joel, in order to be used, in order for your ministry to be impactful, in order for your ministry to grow, you need to adapt and you need to evolve to have more of an ownership mentality. And I always felt kind of icky whenever he, he, he would say that but I, I trusted him. I listened. So for, the, for the, the past month, I've been struggling with, God, is this the path you want me on? Is this, is this where you want me to go? And I felt inadequate. I felt scared, afraid. And then I realized that I had been listening to the wrong influence that mentor from a couple years ago had given me terrible advice. I will never own this church. I will never act like I own this church because I know that God has called me to steward City Life Church. It's scary to take risks. It's not easy. It's hard. You're uncomfortable. If I look at my life, look at what Christ has done for me. See, I have I brought him nothing. I bring nothing into the relationship. But he's given me everything. that motivates me to give everything back. To steward what he's given me. To steward what he's entrusted me with. Whatever risk you face for the kingdom, take it. Steward it. 
if we think it's ours, it's yours, and, and you buried it, and, and I feel sorry for you when you see him one day. Christ wants your joy. He doesn't want a servant who serves faithfully, but does it out of fear or out of obligation. He wants your joy. And I'm not trying to teach a prosperity gospel where I say, give, give God this and give God this and he'll return you health and wealth. And no, I'm just telling you the gospel. He wants your joy. So the three questions I want you to ask yourself walking away today. Do I really believe everything I have is a gift from God? Your job, your family, your health, your stuff. Do I, the second question is, do I really believe I'll be held accountable for my life? And the third question is, am I taking risks for Jesus? Am I taking risks with my, with my extra time, with my skills, with my money, with my abilities, with my family, my job? What are you investing your life in for Jesus, church? One thing you can do, you can sign up for City Life Communities. Join a community. Invest into the people of, that are sitting next to you in the seats. We're designed to be in community. We're designed to live life together. And if we don't, are we stewarding our life the way we should? You can volunteer. You can sign up to volunteer. And you may, may be here. And you may think, I have no idea what you're talking about. You may be afraid because you don't have that connection. You don't have that relationship with Christ. And if, if, if that's you, if you don't call yourself a follower of Christ, if you don't understand, if you have questions, talk to me after service. There's nothing I'd rather do more than walk you through the gospel and the love that Christ has for you. How are you investing your life? Will you hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Or will you be cast into the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? Or will your works be burnt away? Like, like you know, we, we've been given this gift. And one way we celebrate this gift is through communion. And what communion is, it is an opportunity for us to remember the sacrifice, remember the love that Christ gave us, gives us. And we live in a life where there's distractions, there's junk, and there's things that take our, our focus away from Christ, and we forget this gift. So communion is an opportunity for us to slow down and celebrate it, remember it, acknowledge it, and praise Christ for his love. So it says right before Christ went to die, he had a dinner with his friends. And, and, he, and he, he took the bread. And he broke it. As he broke it, he made a reference to his body. And he said, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me.
then took a cup of wine and said, this wine is, implied the connection to his blood, a reference to his blood, which would be poured out for us. He said, this is the new covenant. Church, we have been given this gift. We remember through the act of communion. How are you taking risks? How are you investing what God has given you? What are you going to do today, tomorrow, this week, this year? How can you commit to better steward what God has given you? I love you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for giving us this gift, showing us love, showing us patience, entrusting everything that we have to us when we don't deserve it. Lord, give us the strength to let go of our egos. Give us the strength to look past our own motives and look to you. Lord, if we don't know, if someone in this room is, doesn't know you and, and is feeling that pull on their heart to respond, Lord, give them the courage to come up and talk to one of us. This is a gift that is freely given. This life is a gift that is freely given. This breath that I'm breathing is a gift freely given. And Lord, give me the strength to steward it for you. Give us as a body in Christ, as your church, to steward what you've given us for you. Thank you so much for all you've done. It's in your name. Amen.